It's four o'clock on the Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Woohoo! Thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. Let's see the real audience. There you guys are in the chat room. Hello, everybody. Let's see who's in there. We've got James M. I can't read that one. Ed Lima, MTP Studios, Dan Weber, Anthony Tone Pfeiffer, Tom Hoy, Mon Tom, <laughs> Dan Weber, Michelle Murray, Fantam Alonis, Marion Laird, D. Turner, Mark Hemley, Robin Thornton, Linda Cullum, Weather Eye, and House. Hi, guys. Uh, okay, so, you know, I started this company 27 years ago. And every single week, people ask me the same questions over and over. And then I realized, you know, not everybody has been watching Taxi TV since episode number one. There, Believe it or not, there's some people that don't watch it every week. Blows my mind. Uh, so because of that, there are a lot of questions that people have that are actually kind of rudimentary that those of you who are regulars probably know the answers to. Those of you who are taxi members almost certainly know the answers to these questions. Uh, those of you who hang out on our forum know uh, the answers to many, if not all, these questions. But to people who are uninitiated, let's say, uh, not part of our musical cult, <laughs> uh, those people don't necessarily know the answers to the question, uh, the big question, which is, how do you get your music placed in TV, film, and commercials? So... I'm going to touch on all this stuff today, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot more that I could add to it, but I've got about 2,200 words of notes written here and just spent hours writing them out. So if I forget stuff or you have extra questions, don't be shy about asking them, but wait till the end of the show because I'll probably have like a little rhythm going on and uh, want to stick with my, my flow. So save them up, write them down, and get ready to ask them at the end of the show. So the first one is... Why should you consider licensing your music for film, TV, and commercials, even when you're trying to make it in the industry as a songwriter or an artist, right? Like, you know, you want to be famous as an artist, or you want to write hit songs for other big artists on major labels and what have you. Um, gee, why should I do music licensing? Well, licensing your music is more realistic and easier to achieve than getting a record deal or trying to get your songs cut by a big artist. Trying to get a record deal is tough. It's always been tough. It's even tougher now. Um, getting your songs cut by a big artist, I mean, honestly, unless you're part of that writer's camp, a song camp with them, co-writing with them, it's really, really, really hard. The days of publishers signing a bunch of writers to publishing deals and then going out and pitching that stuff to artists, not so much. Now they're pitching writer producers and trying to get them into a camp. So you gotta kind of be connected more so than in the past, and it was pretty darn hard in the past. Um, so licensing your music is more realistic and easier to achieve, I believe, than trying to go the indie artist route uh, and build a fan base through social media and other online methodologies. While it is entirely possible to become a hit artist marketing yourself online, because it has been done, it's just been done you know, a couple handfuls of times, um, it takes an insane amount of work an incredible dedication and you have to develop real marketing skills and you have to do it like you know 12 hours a day seven days a week you have to be relentless it is essentially starting a business and i mean come on you can't open up a pizza joint and not put a lot of work into it and yet expect it to be successful or any other business being a hit artist uh, especially as an indie on the internet that's a full-time gig so to, need, to go the indie artist route, you need to, number one, write great songs that resonate with a big enough audience to drive streams and downloads to earn real income. You know, I mean, you can put yourself out there as an indie artist and you can post on Instagram, you can post on Twitter, you can post on Facebook. Um, a lot of people do that. Millions of musicians do that. And millions of musicians aren't successful because those things don't work unless you're doing them exactly the right way and doing them every day, all day, relentlessly for a long period of time until you start to gain traction. If you have the fantasy that, hey, I'm going to, you know, 
tweet once a day and throw up a Facebook post once twice a day and a couple of photos on Instagram. Here's my new guitar, and here's me in my bedroom studio, and here's my new song. It's not going to gain any traction. I guess there's you know maybe a one in a million or one in ten million chance that you could create something that goes viral. If that happens, it just doesn't happen very often, so it's not a very good bet. Um, things that you'd need to learn. You'd need to learn how to shoot and edit videos to market yourself on YouTube. Uh, then you need to learn how to reach out to clubs and other venues to book your own shows because, of course, to break out as an indie artist, got to do shows, right? Uh, you need to plan your own tours. That takes a lot of work. Um, you need to have the gear and the transportation, really good, solid transportation, which unfortunately a lot of my uh, indie musician friends don't have really good, solid, reliable transportation that they can use to travel and perform at those gigs. And you have to have enough cash on hand to like get your, you know, your vehicle um, tuned up and get new tires on it and get it prepped to go on the road. You have to have enough cash to um, print your own t-shirts for merch and whatever other kinds of merch you want to do. You have to have enough cash on hand to start the tour. You can't just say, you know what, I'm going to quit my job tomorrow and I'm going to go tour. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. So... Oh, you also have to have a big enough fan following that you can get people to come out to your gigs so that you can deepen your relationship with them and hopefully sell them some merch and get them to download your music or stream it or tell their friends about it. It's a process. It's not easy. It doesn't happen overnight. And a lot of people just don't have the time in their lives to do it. Um, let's see. You need to be relatively free from adult responsibilities like having a family, a mortgage, or job that pays you, uh, pays for those things and many other life expect expenses. I was going to say life expectancy. Um, in other words, you need to be able to leave your life behind and go out on the road and give it all you've got to pursue your dream. That's tough for a lot of people. Um, it's, it's nearly impossible for most people, frankly. And most importantly, you need to know, oops, you need to hope that your extended absence doesn't destroy your relationships with your family and friends at home. Can't you just hear, you know, uh, bye kids, mommy's going out on the road for the next few months. Not realistic in my opinion. It can be done. I won't say that it can't be done. Most people can't do it though. Um, so one last thought, that even if you succeed at building a following that's big enough to support your touring, do you really want to be doing that? This is a question I ask myself over and over. Do you want to be doing that indie artist thing on the road, sleeping in flea bag motels or sleeping in your van or crashing on people's couches once you're in like your 50s and 60s? It's something that you could probably do a little more easily when you're 20-something, maybe even into your 30s if you're really hardcore and you really want it. And man, oh man, I have tremendous respect for people that do it. Most people just don't have the wherewithal. They don't have the startup cash. And the sad part is they do it, and let's say that they pull it off, that they're touring all the time, and they're making some money. They might even earn, you know, 50 grand, 100 grand. I know a couple of guys I can think of, one in particular that I'm certain makes several hundred thousand dollars a year doing it. But it's his life's pursuit. He's got his act really together on a business level and on a musical level. Um, but what do you do when you are 50-something or 60-something and you just don't have it in you physically to do it anymore or maybe you don't want to do it anymore just because of your age category and where you're at in your life, the income stops. And then what do you have? You know, you, you don't have an ongoing income stream because you were playing clubs for the last 10 years sleeping in a van. So let's see. Oh, I covered that already. So there's no ongoing income stream. By the way, my, my friend that makes several hundred thousand dollars a year doing it also has a really large music licensing catalog that he's developed over the years. When he's in a hotel room at night, he's making music and sending it back to the music library. So he's smart. This guy's got his business act together, and I applaud him. And I wish that everybody who wants to follow that dream can do it. They can do it. It's a matter of how hard they want to work at doing it. And trust me, my friend that does it, this guy is, he's a juggernaut. He just works at it every minute of every day. I don't know that 
uh, he does much else in his life, but I give him a lot of credit. I wouldn't have the stamina or wherewithal. So why do I think that music licensing is such a great path if you'd like to get your music out there and earn income with it? Well, number one, maybe my favorite, favorite aspect is you can do it from home in your jammies. Um, you can start doing it in your spare time, and once you get really good at it, you can ramp up your output, eventually create a full-time income from doing it. You don't need to be an amazing composer for instrumentals um, to do instrumentals for film and TV. And I'm not talking about like scoring big feature films, but for uh, music, you know, uh, instrumental cues that get used in music or in uh, reality TV shows, they are not looking for the world's best composer. They're looking for the right music for a scene. You've probably heard me say that dozens of times on, on this show, that editors who are editing a reality show or somebody working on a movie of the week, they're not looking for incredible composers that are going to, you know, like be at a level of John Williams or somebody, Danny Elfman. They're not looking for that. They're looking for music that's going to play for 12 seconds to underscore a scene in a reality show. What they're looking for is the emotion and oftentimes simplicity so it doesn't get in the way of the action on the screen. Um, Music that you create today can generate income maybe even for decades afterwards. So it creates an ongoing income stream. Uh, the more music you create, the more income your music can earn for you. It's cumulative and it grows over time. So something that you create today in 2019, um, let's say you create it today, it gets signed to a production music library, which is a purveyor of music for film and television. Um, and it gets placed three months from now in an episode of Catfish um, on MTV. Is it Catfish on MTV or VH1? Any idea? MTV. Okay. Bria knew the answer. Yay. Thank God for that. So you get it placed in an episode of Catfish, and Catfish is syndicated all over the world uh, on MTV stations, and it repeats, and it's ongoing. Now, that same piece of music might get placed in 2021 and then in 2028 and then in 2032 just over and over so as your catalog grows so do the number of placements you're going to get and oftentimes with the same pieces of music because if it's desirable for one editor or one music supervisor it's probably going to be desirable for others so the more music you create, the more income you earn, it's cumulative and it keeps growing. Remember that. It's really important. Licensing your music, especially songs, can help you build an audience and a fan base if you want to build a career as an indie artist. There are many, many, many documented cases where people have had a song on a TV show um, and it was featured in the show uh, maybe over, uh, what do they call that thing at the end of the show? I can never remember the name of it, um, a, a, a montage where the song is basically doing what the storyline or the script would do and the lyrics of the song kind of fill in the blanks. So something that's featured up front like that doesn't have any dialogue going on with it and it resonates with a lot of people is probably going to generate some downloads and help up your ante as an artist. So it can do both. Um, licensing instrumentals, in my opinion, is a faster way to start earning income. Uh, and it doesn't preclude you from also creating songs. Just because you're doing instrumentals for reality TV, that doesn't mean that you have to stop doing songs, right? Why would you? And it also helps you get better and faster with your gear and with your writing so that you're not going to spend as much time as you normally would on doing songs um, because you, you know what your favorite snare drum sound is. You know which bass sound works on an R&B cut. Um, you know which reverb works on vocals. So just by doing the daily practice uh, or the daily routine of creating instrumental cues, you're, you're practicing all these different aspects of what it takes to also produce songs and ultimately records if you want to. Um, Okay, got that covered. So, what works and what doesn't work when you start going down the path of licensing your music? Well, pitching music from a CD that you made probably a few years ago is a bad idea in my opinion because the music is probably dated and you've only got 10 or 12 songs in the CD that weren't created specifically for licensing in film, TV, or commercials. 
you're going to need much more music than 10 or 12 songs if you want to create a real income. But a lot of people fall into this trap where, let's say, three, four, five years ago, they spent 10 or 20 or $30,000 recording their their life's work, if you will. It's their grand opus. And I, I feel for these folks. I really do. They're passionate about their music and they invested all this time and money in creating the music and going into the studio and getting it, uh, getting the album finished and then designing an album cover and getting the credits all squared away and sending it to disc makers and pressing up a thousand copies. And it didn't really sell all that well because they didn't have a marketing plan, they didn't have a marketing budget, and now they're sitting on top of 875 CDs. Gee, what do I do with those? So they end up joining Taxi, and then they start doing uh, the square peg into the round hole routine. Well, that, that listing, that request for music, isn't exactly, my song isn't like really on top of that, you know, not really well suited, but my song is so awesome that I'm going to send it in anyway, because certainly the person screening the music at Taxi is going to hear how wonderful it is, and then they're going to forward it to the music supervisor working on that big famous feature film, and they're going to use my song just because it's so awesome. Not going to happen. That doesn't happen. Square pegs do not fit in round holes. And we see this time and time again with people that have a CD that they put their life into, just every ounce of their energy, and they were so proud, and they had a CD release party, and sadly, it's all they've got. And they start submitting it to all kinds of taxi listings and it just doesn't work because they are constantly trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. So don't do that. Chances are your music that you created for that CD is too personal with lyrics that tell too much of your own story. And because of that, it's not gonna work with the story that's on the screen. They've already got a story. They've got a script, they've got a narrative and yours is different. So it's not gonna line up. Um, chances are that your lyrics aren't universal. And by that, I mean lyrics that instead of talking about, and I've used this example a thousand times, it's the only one I can remember. Um, you know, I, I fell in love with Susie under the Eiffel Tower on New Year's Eve in Paris on a cold, snowy night. Way too much detail in there. But if you just talk about, um, I love her, she makes me feel like a million dollars. Still talking about Susie, you're just not using her name or saying it was in Paris on a snowy night on New Year's Eve under the Eiffel Tower. She makes me feel like a million dollars. She makes my heart race. She makes my life feel complete. I wanna spend the rest of my life with this person. Those are universal general concepts that can work in almost any scene, let's say in this case, it would be about a relationship. So most people don't write songs that are that general or that universal. And uh, therefore the music that they put on their CDs that they spent all that money and all that time, all that effort on, they've got a CD that again is not that usable. Um, here's another scenario. Uh, let's say that you made that CD five years ago and you worked with an engineer producer, you know, in whatever city you live in and you join Taxi and you pitch a song from that CD and it makes it through the screener and lands in the hands of the music supervisor and the music supervisor reaches out to you and says, I need an alternate mix. Um, can you drop out the lead guitar and the background vocals and give me that mix? And you say, well, gee, I don't know. I'm gonna have to track down the engineer producer that I worked with five years ago oh, look at that, he moved, he's not in town anymore, and the phone number I have doesn't work anymore. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't. Well, then you're out. But if you had created that music on your own, in your own home studio, you would have the ability to just pull up that session and retool the mix, and boom, you could deliver it in a timely fashion and land a nice placement. Um, the vast majority of music placed in films, TV shows, and commercials that gets licensed was pitched in response to a specific request. Um, those are called a brief. A brief is a short description of what's needed. Um, might include the genre, the tempo, the lyric theme, and specifics regarding the arrangement and production. You know, stuff like uh, we don't want something that's too full or too busy, or maybe we do want something that's a big orchestral hybrid of electronic stuff, synths or whatever, um, combined with the orchestral stuff, whatever the brief asks for, that's what you submit. 
that's the cool part of being about being able to make your own music is that you're always submitting stuff that's in response to a request rather than submitting music that you've had sitting on a CD for years that doesn't fit. So you may have 12 of the greatest songs ever written on that CD, but if they don't line up with what the music supervisor needs at that point in time for a given scene, they won't need and they won't use your songs, no matter how great they are. Greatest material in the world, doesn't matter. If it doesn't fit the request, they can't use it. They might compliment you and say, wow, that's really awesome. But even that's doubtful because they're super busy and they don't have time to just sit around and listen to music and go, wow, that's the most awesome song I've heard in a month. I think I'll call this person up and tell them how great it is. Here's a phrase that's probably never heard in the music licensing business. I really can't imagine anybody saying this. This rock song is so good, I'll use it in my film, even though it has nothing to do with the story I'm telling or the emotion I'm going for. Especially, um, think about this. What if you're doing a period piece that takes place, you know, during the Renaissance period, and the music for that film would probably be scored, sound like it was music from the Renaissance period. Um, and yes, somebody's going to say, what about that film, uh, what's her name, Coppola did years ago that was Renaissance period and had a bunch of rock stuff in it. That was an exception. There are always exceptions. They're very few and very far between. If you want to create an income, an ongoing income in a career with music licensing, don't wait for that one in a million exception because you won't be able to create the kind of income that you need to sustain. Um, but you can't imagine in that Renaissance period piece a rock song in there, right? So you could have the greatest rock song in the world, but it ain't happening for that kind of movie. So you need to know what the people in the industry need and when they need it. So to have a real shot at becoming successful, licensing your music to TV shows, films and commercials and documentaries and all that stuff, you need to be able to create music that fills requests. And while you might think that sounds like it could stifle your creativity, I've been asking people for the last 27 years, do you feel like your creativity is stifled because you're filling orders as it were? You're actually reading briefs or taxi listings and going, I can create something that sounds like what they need and send it to them. Uh, literally, I've never had one person say to me, yes, it stifles me. Quite the opposite, actually. Many of them tell me that it actually stimulates their creativity because without that brief and without that specific request and without those known requirements, they will just do what most of us do, which is procrastinate, meaning they won't make any music, um, or they'll wanna make music and they can't come up with something that inspires them. Or if they do start something, they don't finish it because they're not shooting at a specific target and they don't have a deadline. So no target, no deadline, they do what all of us are prone to do, which is procrastinate, turn on TV, turn on a video game, look at Facebook, and you just never get around to it. So there you go. To have a real shot at becoming successful, licensing your music, uh, you need to learn how to fill requests, okay? Filling orders. I know it doesn't sound sexy, it doesn't sound artistic, it doesn't sound romantic, but it works. So having a framework or a structure to work in often helps you finish the song, which is one of the greatest career killers that I've ever seen in my 40 years in the industry, which is unfinished material never lands anywhere because it's unfinished, right? So how many tracks or songs do you need to gain critical mass and start earning good income? I get asked that question all the time. And I think that, well, you know what? I'm just gonna stick with my notes. <laughs> It's a common misconception that you need dozens or maybe even hundreds of songs or instrumental tracks to start earning income with your music. If you choose to create music in response to requests from music libraries, music supervisors, or ad, agency, ad agencies, you don't need to have anything ready to go to get started. Think about that. Why would you want to create, let's say, 200 instrumental cues for music libraries if you didn't know what they need? And frankly, you're probably not going to create stuff. Not only would you be creating stuff in genres or styles they don't need, you're probably going to miss the boat on doing things like 
short to no intro or using what's called Q format, instrumental Q format, which is different from a, a typical song form. Um, you might not know what a buttoned ending is. You might not know what a sting out is. So all these little things are part and parcel to creating music that's viable for film and television and commercials. And by the way, each one of those disciplines is different from the other. Music you would create for a reality show is probably going to be very different from music that you would create for a movie of the week, uh, which is going to be different from the music that you would create for a documentary, which is different from the music that you would create for a major feature film, which is also different from music that you would create for an advertisement, a commercial. So over time, you have to learn what the different styles and disciplines are for each of those things. Because again, it's not just as simple as, I've got the greatest rock song ever written and you should use it in whatever you're working on. Take my round peg and stick it in your square hole. Doesn't work. Um, so you likely create a bunch of music that's not needed because it's not in response to specific requests. And chances are you won't finish any songs or instrumentals because you'll feel stuck in the I got nothing world you're probably in right now. I mean, come on, let's face it. Most of you watching us, not the taxi members who are already part of the club and know the drill, but the people who aren't taxi members yet, uh, you've probably been wanting this for years, five years, 10 years, maybe multiple decades. And how many pieces of music can you honestly say that you have finished, they are done? right? Totally done. Mixed, like in the can and nothing about them that you would revise. They are finished. Probably very few, if any. It's so easy to not finish stuff. You know why? Because when you finish it, then you have to go, okay, here it is. It's done. And frankly, I understand this. Uh, once it's done, then you have to present it to people. And then you're going to get their opinions. And we all fear negative opinions. We don't want negative feedback. So it's just easier to kind of procrastinate your way into not finishing stuff because if it's not done, you can always say, well, it's not done or it's, it's not a final mix or I'm waiting until I get that awesome new keyboard or this awesome new um, software before I finish it. You can use a million excuses for it not being done that protect you from any bad feedback, which you could potentially get on a piece that's finished. So, um, the question is, how many songs or instrumental cues do I need to make a real income doing uh, licensing my music? And the answer is, it depends. Songs and instrumentals, let, let's stick with TV for the moment and let's talk about songs and instrumentals in that context. If, if you're doing instrumentals, um, now, let's look at a typical reality show that has somewhere around 80 different instrumental cues that generally get used for, excuse me, a couple of seconds, maybe up to 10, 12, 15 seconds, maybe even 30 seconds. Extremely rare, extremely, almost like never happens that they would use an entire 90 second or two minute instrumental cue. But they use all these little snippets of cues to act as punctuation at the end of a scene or the beginning of a new scene or creating tension between two people who are having a conversation or maybe something that adds to the comedic value of a particular um, you know, part of, part of a scene. So that considered, there's a lot more instrumental music that's needed than songs. However, Instrumentals rarely pay a sync fee, which is upfront money for licensing your song or, or your piece of music. Um, and generally you only get paid um, the back end, which comes from uh, ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, or whoever your PRO is, performing rights organization. So um, now songs, conversely, can pay a lot more money. You might get 2,500 or three grand or 3,500, maybe even five grand or seven grand. Um, up front for the use of your song in a particular scene in a, a TV show. However, they only generally need a few songs in a TV show. Uh, even a TV show that uses a lot of music, something that's got scenes in what I like to call bars, cars, and restaurants, um, it's going to be background music. Sometimes it's going to be source music, meaning that the people who are in the scene, the actors in the scene, the characters, better description, the characters in the scene would be able to hear the music where they're at. So if you have two people in a restaurant having a romantic dinner, 
uh, and there's piano music playing in the background, that would be um, a source cue because it's either coming out of speakers in the ceiling or it's coming from a piano player off in the distance somewhere. Um, it could just be background music that isn't necessarily part of the scene. It's just laid into the scene to make it a little more interesting or give it a little wallpaper in the background. Um, so those, those things, those moments, those instances happen, I don't know, you know, a few times per hour long TV drama. So with reality TV, you're going to get 80 or so opportunities to get your music in there. And with an hour long uh, drama, you're going to have one, two, three, four, maybe five on a really good day opportunities to get your music in there. So one is a much higher probability to get your music placed with a lower payday. And the other one is a much lower probability of getting your music placed with a higher payday. My advice, do both. Um, like I said, you're going to get better at doing songs as you do enough cues. Oh, crud. <laughs> I've got to scratch my eye. And I cut my finger yesterday, so I've got a Band-Aid on my eye scratching finger. What a bummer. Um, well, that worked. That was too easy. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, so, so one helps you do the other, and then you've got both options. And, and frankly, some of our members, taxi members that are earning six-figure incomes do both. I would say, and this is just an educated guess based on my conversations with them, but our six-figure members probably do more instrumental placements, uh, but they do do some song placements. There are some taxi members that are making a six-figure income, and they only do instrumental stuff. Um, so don't don't build a catalog. This is something people do. They use it. I think they use it, whether they realize it or not, is an excuse for not getting started. They think, oh, I need to have a couple hundred instrumental cues written before I would join Taxi or before I would start reaching out to people on my own. You don't. You just really don't. You're, you're much better off waiting to find out what they need right now in the moment then spending days, weeks, or months creating a bunch of music that they may never need. In all probability, they won't. So why would you want to do that? Um, so the, the question is, well, how many do I need out there in the world um, once I do start doing this before I can start to see significant income? And that, of course, depends as well. It, it depends on the type of music you're making. Um, let's say you're doing something, uh, I'm trying to think of something obscure. Let's say you're doing death metal. There are going to be far fewer, it's not obscure, I don't want to insult any death metal people out there, so please don't send cards, letters, or, or emails. But it, it's something that doesn't come up as a request nearly as frequently as pop or um, singer-songwriter or tension cues in the instrumental world. There are just some things that get requested far more often than others. So you could have 5,000 death metal songs, but you're not going to make any significant money with that. So why bother building up a catalog of a bunch of styles or genres that aren't needed? Again, why, why would you want to build up inventory for something that people don't want to buy? it's much smarter, much easier to just wait for them to tell you what they need and when they need it and just go create it and get it to them. So, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow your mind. Um, now, I want you to understand, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm not a certified financial planner, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a tax advisor, I'm none of those things. But several years ago, we had a gentleman who was a certified financial planner um, on stage with me at our convention, the Taxi Road Rally. And we projected that if somebody started doing uh, music for television or film and TV, I, I think presumably at this time, we were probably thinking about mostly doing instrumental stuff and starting as a 36 year old, okay? And doing this for 30 years. So starting as a 36 year old, um, and then, or maybe it was 35 year old and then retiring at 65 years old. So you would have done it for 30 years. How much money would you have at the end of 30 years to retire with? So 
he came up with these numbers based on his own experience and having a pretty wide network of friends that also do this. And so he figured, well, in the first year, you're going to maybe generate, uh, oh, by the way, this is all compounded interest at 5%. Okay, so he figured the first year you do $1,000. Um, pretty modest. Second year, $1,500. The third year, $1,850. The fourth year, $2,400. Uh, the fifth year, $1,900. The sixth year, $3,600. And you're going, well, that's not a lot of money. Um, the seventh year, $4,200. So just to let you know, we do have taxi members that really took this seriously and hunkered down and worked really hard at it every day of the week. And uh, I'm thinking of one guy in particular, uh, let's just call him Matt. Um, and he makes music out of a tool shed in his backyard with very minimal equipment. I think by the time he was doing this, like six or seven years, that he was very close to making $100,000 a year. Um, so these numbers are extremely conservative. So by this person, I, I was at year number seven, uh, 4,200. Year number eight, 6,500. Year number nine, $10,000 a year. 12,000 and 15,000 and 15,000 again, then 18,000 and 22,000, then 25,000. I'm now up to year 15, then 28,000 and 32,000. See how we don't have any years where it's like growing in huge leaps and bounds? This is pretty conservative. Um, then 36,000 and 40,000 and 44,000 and then 48,000, 52,000, 58,000, 64,000, 70,000, 77,000. 85,000, 95,000. In year number 29, at the age of 64, this person um, made 105 grand a year. And finally, in their last year of doing this, that's assuming they don't do it once they retire, which we all know once they retire, they're going to do it very full time. Um, 112 grand. Well, all that money. Um, and I think we had some other assumptions like a 30% tax rate. Um, and spending 10% of the money reinvesting it on new software and such. Um, but being careful with your money, you got to be a saver, no question about that. You can't just take the money at the end of every year and spend it. You've got to invest it and hope that you can make 5% average over this 30-year period. Well, all things considered in this scenario, you would have $1.679 million. So almost $1.7 million in the bank saved up from just doing instrumental music. I don't know too many people that retire with $1.7 million. I don't know too many musicians that, re that retire with that kind of money. So it's doable. You got to do it. Uh, but you've got to work at it every day. And you've got to understand that in the first year or two or three or five, you're not going to make a whole lot of money. So you got to hang in there and just keep doing it with kind of blind faith that other people before you have done it and have hit these numbers and have succeeded with you know, a really nice retirement fund. Um, where am I? Uh, oh, I already did this. I already covered explain the difference between how instrumental cues pay and how many songs are needed. So I got that covered. So back to the question of how much money can I make licensing my music? Well, that depend, depends on how much music you make, how well you make it, how often you pitch it, and how on target your styles uh, are for the pitches that you're pitching to. We have taxi members who make nothing because they don't create much. They don't read our industry listings every day, uh, which blows my mind. If somebody, you know, if I were making music and somebody was telling me every day, giving me like three new opportunities a day that are very real, um, I would want to know what those are. Um, some people just don't even bother to open their emails, which is mind blowing to me. They don't read our industry listings and they just, they miss on opportunities that they should probably be pitching their music for. Why? I do not know. Maybe they're distracted by Facebook. Maybe they're distracted by Instagram. Maybe they're distracted by television. But please, dear God, take five minutes out, not even, take three minutes out of your day just to look at these opportunities that we're putting under your nose. Um, we have other members who make a few hundred a year doing this very, very part-time. And yet we have others who make a few thousand a year and, and they're growing. 
um, because they make it part-time, but, you know, they, they make a point of doing it on a regular basis. They read the listings, they create a lot of the right kind of music that answers the request that we put under their nose, and they keep learning and they keep improving. So it, it's up to you. You know, you could make nothing or you could join our uh, six-figure members. And we have members that are making multiple six figures doing primarily instrumental cues. Um, that's all they do now is create music, uh, which I think most musicians would love to do that. So it's up to you. Um, to answer the question in another way, how many pieces of music do I need to have? I think it's fairly safe to say that our members who have a thousand instrumental cues, maybe some songs mixed in there as well, out there in a bunch of libraries, not just in one library, you want to spread your bets around to several different catalogs. Um, I would say that they probably have somewhere around a thousand cues out there. Um, I kind of remember Matt Hurt, who's definitely one of our six figure members, that years ago, maybe even as far back as 10 years ago, when I know that he had definitely crossed over the six figure line, I think I asked him back then how many cues he had out there, and I think he said 1,500. Now that doesn't mean 1500 where it's 500 pieces of music and then cut downs or alt mixes that create 1500 in total. He meant 1500 specific pieces of music of which there are cut downs or alt mixes of those. So he might have thousands of variations out there in the wild. Um, the best part of this whole thing is that you do the work once, but it continues to earn income for you over and over and over again. Almost all of our successful members have told me, I think not almost all, all of them have told me that it's a small percentage of the music that they've created and put in catalogs out there, small percentage that actually earn them income. And of those, that small percentage of, of pieces of music that earn them income, that many of those pieces continue to earn them income over and over and over again. So like I said at the beginning of this, it's cumulative. Um, something you create today might generate money, you know, 30 days from now or 90 days from now or six months from now. And then again, a couple of years from now and a couple of years after that and a couple of years after that. Meanwhile, you're constantly feeding the pipeline and creating new layers. Think of it as like building a brick garden wall, okay? First layer of bricks is gonna bring in some money from some of those bricks. Next layer of bricks is gonna bring in some money as well, while that first layer of bricks is also continuing to earn. And then the third layer of bricks can earns you money while the first and second layers of bricks are already earning you money. So as you can see, it's cumulative. And you have to do a lot of hand motions when you're telling people about it to make it really stick. Um, yep, I think I've got that covered mailbox money, passive income. It's everybody's not uh, everybody's dream, not just musicians. I think we would all love to have mailbox money. Do the work once, have it generate income infinitely. Or as we like to say, ad infinitum. There, that was my big word use of the day. So what genres of music are most often requested? This is the money question, isn't it? Um, why create music that isn't needed? The truth is that sooner or later, virtually every type of music is needed, but some are needed much more often than others. Um, just today, and this is absolutely true, um, I saw an email, somebody put out a couple of briefs, and they were looking for Albanian thrash metal. So if you're the person that has Albanian thrash metal, you're you know, in the money today, especially if you have Albanian thrash metal that the music supervisor thinks works in that particular scene. Now, how often have I seen a request for Albanian thrash metal in my 30 some year career? Once, and today was that day. So if you're thinking about making money with Albanian thrash metal, think again. Um, it, it's just not gonna be a winner for you. Conversely, We've had requests for hip hop, EDM, top 40 pop, and dramedy virtually every week of the year for as long as I can remember. I'll repeat those again, hip hop, EDM, top 40 pop, and dramedy every week of the year. And by, by the way, dramedy, if you don't know what the definition of dramedy music is, um, 
what was that show, Bria, with people always peeking in windows? Uh, Desperate Housewives. The do 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 do. That sneaking around the bushes, looking in windows music. It's usually got like uh, maybe uh, a vibraphone in it, um, combined with pizzicato strings. Do 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 do. And it sounds mischievous, and that's what dramedy music typically is. Um, so I looked at the request that Taxi currently has on our website today, like an hour ago, and some of the things that we currently need, this isn't all of them, this is many of them, but not all. Um, adult contemporary, country, jazz, singer-songwriter, Christmas and holiday music, pop, Latin, R&B soul, rock, future bass, Middle Eastern, trap, urban dramedy, which is dramedy but with a little urban flair to it, um, alt country, tension cues, indie folk, percussion driven instrumentals, and rap hip hop. Um, and that's just what's needed today, right now. So, and, and we get new requests every day of the year on top of that stuff. So there you go. There's a prescription for what is needed. Um, again, I wouldn't sit down and blindly create music in all those genres. Um, I would wait for requests and just know that you are now making music that is specifically answering a need that a music industry professional has right now. How much and what type of gear do I need in my studio? I get asked that question all the time. And look, I, I'm a studio rat. I am first and foremost a guy who loves microphones and wires. I just love them. I love recording studios. I get excited when I walk into a studio. I'm not going to tell you how excited, but I get pretty excited, okay? So how much gear do you need? Not very much is the answer. You really just need the basics. And I know that musicians don't want to hear that because every guy musician, I can't speak for the ladies because I'm not one, but I can tell you that my male friends who are studio, you know what, I know some women who are studio nuts. We all want to have an excuse to go to our spouse and go, honey, I need to buy a new compressor for $900 or I need to buy a, a new Strat or I need to buy a whatever. We all love a reason to buy a new piece of gear because you can touch it, you can hold it, you can caress it, you can make all kinds of noise with it, and you can have so much fun with it. But you know what? It's not going to make you any more money. It's only going to satisfy your gear urge, which I completely understand. And frankly, I'll cut you a little slack on that one just because I, I totally get it. But you don't need all that stuff. Many, many, many of our six-figure taxi members really just have, like, some of them only have, like, a three-octave MIDI keyboard that's maybe five or ten years old. Um, you know, a five-year-old iMac with surprisingly little um, RAM in it. Sometimes I'm a little freaked out when people tell me, yeah, I got an iMac with two megs or two gigs of RAM in it. It's like, really? Um, I, I would have, like, what? Oh, Bri is pointing at her laptop across the table from me. Uh, but you can make music on a five-year-old iMac with a, a couple of gigs of RAM. It's not going to be um, as fast and as wonderful as a brand new iMac with like 32 gigs of RAM in it. Um, but you can still do it. Um, and frankly, you don't need to go out and buy like a $3,000 orchestral library. Um, go buy yourself a $200 library and learn how to use it really well because even though you're buying the multi-thousand dollar library and it sounds great, it's still not going to sound right because until you know how to do the articulations. And, and you can learn that in a $200 library. And frankly, a $200 library used well will almost certainly sound better than a $2,000 library that's not used well. Same thing could be said for a drum set. Um, I used to have a drummer friend named Yogi Horton when I lived in New York, and, and he was um, a drummer for a lot of famous acts. Probably Luther was probably Luther Vandross was probably um, the act that he was most famous for working with, and it, it was astonishing to me. Um, Yogi would come into the studio. I, I would use him on a session every now and then, and people would come in and bring like a really crummy drum set. 
Um, and let's say that the drummer on a record just wasn't copying the right feel and we had to bring in an outside drummer and I called Yogi. The same drum set with the same microphones, the same EQ, the same everything played by a drummer with excellent touch sounded freaking amazing. And then for that particular studio, which was the one I worked in all the time, um, I bought a real, I took Yogi with me to Sam Ash actually and let him, I said, pick out any drum set in the store for the studio and that's what's going to live in my room and he picked out a, a really nice Yamaha set that was thousands of dollars I, I want to say six thousand bucks or something it was really expensive and if I played it it sounded like crap if Yogi played it it sounded like amazing just you can't even imagine like so little EQ, so little compression. I mean, you could throw almost any microphone in front of it and it would sound great because Yogi had the touch. So you combine the touch with a great drum set and got magic out of it. So put a mediocre drummer on an incredible set where the drummer doesn't have great touch and you're going to have to add a lot of EQ, a lot of compression and just work those microphones like crazy and it still won't sound as good as Yogi Horton um, playing a mediocre set. Anyway, um, okay, so getting back to how much gear you actually need. Many of our six-figure members actually have like a decent computer, a MIDI keyboard, like I said, some of them even have just like a little three-octave job, a pair of speakers. Typically, if I had to guesstimate how much they spend on their monitors, I don't know, 500-ish dollars. Um, you know, a pair of NS10s. Uh, I don't even know how much those cost now. I got these like 30 years ago, I think. But uh, NS10 is not cheap. You don't need Genlex. Um, you don't need a multi-thousand dollar pair of monitors. Frankly, a $500 pair of KRKs will be just fine. Um, and no, I don't get a kickback for recommending those, but I know a lot of people use them and they really like them. Um, let's see. Oh, and then software. Oh, uh, a microphone or two. And, and do you need to have a $3,000 Neumann? No, you really don't. Um, could you make great sounding stuff with, you know, a $200 condenser microphone? Absolutely. Absolutely. Nobody who is on the licensing end who is going to license your music is going to say, you know, I'm pretty sure that they used a Neumann on that vocal. Therefore, I'm going to put this in my movie. They wouldn't care if it was recorded on a 57 with a sock over it. They really wouldn't. As long as the song fits the scene and the vocal sounds reasonably well recorded, it's probably going to work. So again, um, basic computer, um, basic MIDI keyboard, $200 microphone, probably be a good idea to have one dynamic mic like a 57 or a Sennheiser 421. Um, you know, maybe an Audio Technica or a Blue microphone, something that's affordable but is known to sound really good. Um, let's see, what else do you need? Probably a Strat. Everybody should have a Strat in their studio. Everybody should have a good sounding acoustic guitar in their studio. Um, probably have a, a P bass in your studio. Um, I think that about covers it. Maybe a couple little pieces of percussion instruments, you know, maybe maybe some real congas in the studio if you can find some at a yard sale or something. Um, a guiro, shakers, that's about it, you know. And, and I only added those percussion things because if you add real live percussion with a human being playing on top of a track that's largely MIDI generated, it will humanize it and make it sound better. So that's it. Um, Music doesn't get licensed because you've got the latest, greatest compressor, other esoteric outboard gear. Music gets licensed because it's the right music for the right request at the right time. All that is critical. So going back to my original question that started this whole thing out, how do you get your music placed? Well, while you might think that the owner of Taxi is going to turn this into a commercial for Taxi, I'm not. Um, because frankly, uh, as we said in our brochure for 20 some years, taxi is the second best way to get your music licensed. The first best way is doing it yourself. Um, you know what? Do the research. Uh, the internet is a wonderful thing. Magazines are a wonderful thing. Directories are a wonderful thing. Do the research and find out who the music supervisors are, who the music libraries are, and then find out what they need and when they need it. Now, in order to get them to want to talk to you, you have to act like a professional. 
No, you have to be a professional, actually, because um, acting like one, you can be, they'll quickly discover that you're faking it. But be a professional. Be courteous. Um, be succinct. Make it about them, not about you. They don't want to hear your life story. Uh, reach out to them after you do some research on them. Find out what they're currently working on. And therefore, let's say somebody's working. Um, I just saw a thing today where somebody was working on a show that I believe is on Showtime. Um, and, and they needed stuff, uh, music, they needed Israeli music for it. So you can find this stuff out. It, it's not easy. It's not like everywhere but you know what uh, send a really polite two sentence email and i'm not joking when i say two sentence email send that to a music supervisor send it out to a hundred music supervisors and a few of them are bound to answer you um, and find out you know what are you working on right now or get a subscription to imdb pro not that much money and you're going oh then i have to spend money so what could you open a pizza joint without buying pizza ovens without buying tables without buying napkins without buying tomato sauce no you're trying to get into a business so spend some money to make some money don't be a cheapskate um so find out go on imdb pro or variety and find out which music supervisors are working on which things oh look at that that show takes place in the middle east they might need Middle Eastern music for that series. So Middle Eastern music in cars, bars, and restaurants. Got people eating in a restaurant, what might be playing in the Middle East in the background or out of those speakers in the ceiling? Um, what might a 24-year-old, because you can read about the log line of the show and find out who the cast is and what the characters are, you can probably figure out, oh, they've got young people who are brand new CIA operatives that are working in the Middle East and uh, so they're going to at some point be in a jeep heading out to the desert what are they what would be on the radio if they were listening to music research it find out then reach out to that music supervisor and say by the way i saw that you're working on xyz show or xyz film and it's taking place in the middle east i've got some great middle eastern pop music would you like to hear it they're bound to say yes because you've got what they need you have solved a problem for them so that is the first way to do it yourself and do it really well. Um, stay in regular contact with them. Um, don't just reach out to them once and think that if they don't reply to you, just give up and turn tail and, and that's it. Um, reach out to them. Don't be obnoxious about it. Again, be professional. But, you know, reach out every few weeks. Um, but don't just, the number one sin is to reach out to them and say, what are you looking for? Actually, that's the number two sin. The number one sin is attaching a song to your email and sending it to a music supervisor saying, I've got the greatest song ever written. You should hear it and put it in your movie. They will hate your guts. They will not respond. They will not love you if they bump into you at a Guild of Music Supervisors event someday. They will remember that you were the person that attached a song to an email um, because they don't like to download those files. Number one, they risk getting all kinds of crud on their computer. And number two, who's got the time to listen to everybody who thinks they've got a brilliant song and is attaching it to an email to send it to them? No, they want to work with industry professionals that send them a link where they can stream the song and then download it if they can use the song. Um, learn how to approach them in a professional manner, blah, 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 I got that. Um, find out what they currently need. Um, but don't follow up if they do say, yeah, I need, that'd be great. Send me some Middle Eastern pop music that would be good for a car radio in the show I'm working on. Don't follow up and say, so, did you like it? Are you using it? Huh? Huh? Did you? Huh? Huh? Do you? They hate that. They are so incredibly busy. They're probably working 12 hours a day, five or six days a week. They don't have the time to coach you. They don't have the time to nurture you. They don't care that you are twisting in the wind with anxiety, waiting to find out if your music is going to be used from them. They just don't care. All they care about is their project, their world, their moment in time right now. Does this person's music solve my problem and will get me a gold star with the executive producer on this TV series because I solved the problem well? If you are that composer or that artist or that songwriter, yay, you're doing it right. But don't follow. Um, they don't want to tell you why they're interested or why they're not interested. They will only reach out to you 99% of the time. 
The only time they're going to get back to you is if they can use the music because then they're going to need to reach out to you and say, okay, I want to make sure this is one stop, meaning that you own it and control it, that you own the master and you own the composition. That's music to their ears. They want to know that you can say, yes, I own and control both of those things and therefore you can use my music. You don't need to talk to any other writers, composers. Um, you don't need to talk to a record label. I'm it. I'm the, the one and only stop. This is one stop. Go ahead, license it. They will talk to you about how much do you want for it. Frankly, most of the time they're going to say, I've got 2,500 bucks for this. Um, you could try and negotiate, but most of my music supervisor friends tell me that when they come at you with a $2,500 budget on something, that's what they can afford. They're not trying to screw you because they don't get to keep the money that they save. It's just what they've got in the budget. And frankly, if it's the first time that you've ever worked with that person, that supervisor, you'd be smart to say, okay. Now, some people say, oh, you're setting yourself up for the future where they're going to uh, try and take advantage of you and lowball you. No, they're going to actually tell you what they've got for that thing, and you can take it or leave it. And yeah, I've heard cases where somebody negotiated a little bit more, but they, they want to be easy. They don't want to have to work at it. Finding the music is, is enough work. Um, and while your music is the most important thing in the world to you, it, it's not to them. Getting their show completed, getting their work done, and making their boss happy is the most important thing in the world to them. So they don't want to spend a lot of time going back and forth with you, even though this is a glorious moment in your life. You've waited for this your entire life and now here it is and it's all you can think about and you tell every one of your family and friends I got a song going in this big TV show for them sadly I know you're not going to want to hear this but you are just another email and just another sign on the dotted line but take it you know what act like a professional no be a professional and they will like you and maybe in the future when they're looking for something that's kind of in that specific uh, style or genre they're going to go back to the folder where they found you in the first place. Um, let's say it's rock. They're going to go back to their rock folder and they're going to go, oh, yeah, I remember that person. Um, yep, really good music, uh, right for the scene I needed at the time. They were timely in getting back to me and they were very professional in the way they dealt with me. I'll reach back out to them again. So just a little hint there. Um, but that is the best way to do it. But a lot of people that have a job, have a family, have all those adult responsibilities, don't have the time to do all this stuff. It is time consuming. If you think you can give it an hour or two a week and end up making a six-figure income, you are wrong. You're just wrong. You can't. Um, anybody who thinks that they can make a six-figure income for doing anything a couple hours a week is absolutely wrong. I don't care if it's a pizza shop, a dog grooming business, nothing. You've got to put real time and real effort and focused effort and a lot of it into it in order to make real money. They don't hand out six-figure incomes to people just because they want something. Just wanting it is not good enough. You have to actually work for it. So if you don't have the time to do the research, you don't have the time to develop the relationships, you don't have the time to stay in touch with the people, you don't have the time to also do that and create the music they need and get it to them on a regular basis in a timely manner, then Taxi might be a good fit for you. But again, I'm, I don't want to turn this into a big sales piece. But, however, I will sell you this. As I was writing this today, I thought, you know, I should plug Robin Frederick's awesome book because it's the only book on the market that actually teaches you what the differences are between, or the difference is between writing songs for radio and records versus writing songs um, that work better in film and TV. And there is a difference. So pick up this book. I'm guessing uh, Bria is probably getting the link right now and she'll post it in there for you guys. But oh, people are saying that they've got it, they love it. Um, and I'm gonna give one of these away today. But if you don't win it on the show today, seriously, this book's like, 35 bucks I think um, and I am the publisher and I do make a few bucks if you buy it but being the publisher who strongly believes in how wonderful this book is if you buy it and you don't think it's everything that those five-star reviews say it is send it back to me in resellable condition and I personally will refund your money okay so there you go um, let's do a book giveaway and to win the book if you've never been part of our 
little cabal of uh, people that like to win stuff on taxi TV. Let me tell you what we're going to do. Um, when I say go, and I will do it just like that, you guys are going to type in plus one. And Bria, who is our producer sitting across the table from me on her laptop, is going to take her finger. She's going to shut her eyes and she's going to run that finger up and down the list of people typing in plus ones. And then she's going to go boink. And whoever Bria's finger lands on gets a copy of this book. And boy, will you be lucky. So I'm going to play the taxi TV theme. And you guys start typing plus one now. Much more fun doing a drawing with music than <laughs> Yeah, if you already have it, don't type in a plus one. And let me know when you're gonna give them the fickle finger. Andrea is shutting her eyes. <laughs> Timothy Butler, congratulations, Timothy Butler. So what you need to do is email taxitv at taxi.com and Bria, which is spelled B-R-I-A-G-H-A-G-H-A, Bria Agha, will send you um, a copy of the book and you should get it in about a week, okay? So congratulations, Timothy Butler. So, excuse me, I am now going to take a drink from our sponsor, Rockstar. Because I just spoke for an hour and six minutes and my throat is really dry. Congratulations, Timothy. Bree is holding up <laughs> my stuff. <laughs> okay, before we go any further, subscribe. Really, you know, you just watched an hour of me talking. You may want to unsubscribe, but uh, hopefully if you want more good information, subscribe to the channel. Share this video with your friends if you liked it. Give it a like because, damn it, we're likable. And click that little bell thing up there in the upper right because it will send you alerts when we're doing more of this good stuff. By the way, we do these shows every Monday at 4 o'clock in Los Angeles. I don't know what that is in your time zone, but you really should subscri subscribe to the channel and watch these every week. Um, so with that, uh, I can either end the show now, being a very short show, an hour and seven minutes, or I'm happy to do Q&A if anybody in the viewing audience has any questions you'd like me to answer. Robin Thornton says, it's midnight here. I'm guessing you're in the UK. 1 a.m. Wow, where are you at, higher self? Keith says, thanks for moving these to YouTube. I guess you haven't seen one in a while. We've been on YouTube now for probably 18 months to two years, I'm guessing. It's been a while, but you're welcome. They, they definitely look better. Um, comment, year two of my membership, I chose why this thing is worth it. Ah, that scrolled off the page too quickly. Um, okay. Um, does Taxi comp uh, request composer show reels? No. Um, honestly, we don't represent composers um, to try and land you gigs to score movies. Um, there's a weird little California law about helping you gain employment. It's one thing to help you license your music. It's another thing to help you gain employment. So we don't do anything that technically would lead you down the path of employment. Um, hey, Michael, Robbie Hancock says, hey, Michael, any ideas for the guest speaker at the rally this year? Um, I've actually had a yes, I would love to do that from somebody really cool, really big, who's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, I'm not counting any chickens until I've got the plane flight booked and know that this person's coming. But we've had an ongoing conversation. I really like him a lot, and uh, I'm hoping that he pulls through. It's somebody who everybody watching the show knows. Um, 
Uh, Brian Michael Fuller says, Michael, really digging all the new abundant listings. Thank your outreach team for us. You know, um, I don't know if I should hold this up. Uh, I'm just going to, no, I'm not going to hold up because some people freeze frame it. I had the A&R department do a little study um, that just in the last 12 calendar months, not in 2019, but from 20, uh, from like, April 1st of 2018 to April 1st, 20, or April 15th, I think, um, 2019. In that year, we added 34 new entities that we are running listings for, be they music supervisors, music libraries, what have you. Um, we are working with so, I mean, 30, we added 34 companies in a year. That's like off the charts better than we've ever done before. And uh, I mean, just, there's some exciting stuff that, you know, I can't disclose. Uh, no, I can't. I can't even hint at it. But we are working so hard to come up with incredible opportunities for you guys and gals. And, uh, yeah, if you've been thinking about joining Taxi, you know what? Don't wait until you've built up a big catalog because, like I said earlier, it'll probably be the wrong catalog. Just jump in and do it. And don't expect to make a fortune. Don't even expect to make your 300 bucks back in your first year. It could happen, but it probably won't. People call the first year of taxi the learning year. But do come to the Road Rally, our free convention for which every taxi member gets a free ticket for him or herself and another one for a guest of their choosing. And the Road Rally is November 7th through the 10th this year in Los Angeles. Go to taxi.com slash rally and look at last year and look at all the stuff. I think we had like 15, 16, 17 incredible panels in the grand ballroom, somewhere in the order of 75 to 90 classes, breakout classes, mentor lunches, one-to-one -one mentor sessions. The, go look at our forums at forums.taxi.com and look at how many people in the success story um, area talk about the deals they got because they sat down with the right mentor at the road rally or they met the right music supervisor at, at the bar at night um, or they were in an elevator and bumped into somebody who owns a music library and conversation ensued and now they've got 25 things at library. Uh, this is not like two people or five people or 10 people, dozens of people, maybe even a couple hundred people come away from the road rally with deals in hand, certainly relationships in hand that often bear fruit in the form of deals or placements down the road, it's mind blowing. Um, we undersell it, if anything, but it, it, it's a thing. Trust me, it's a thing. Uh, Mark Himley says, the road rally has changed my life for sure. Um, <laughs> Cass McKenty says, uh, plus one to the road rally. Is it okay to do a plus one again? Um, Jay Williams says there were so many people there. It's amazing. We get a couple thousand people, um, probably close to 2,500. I mean, yeah, 2,500 is a pretty fair number because um, well, I don't. There's something I don't want to say. Anyway, uh, out of all those people, somehow the road rally still feels really homespun. It feels like uncompetitive. I guess is the best way to describe it. You go to other conventions, and, and it's like. Uh, people clawing at each other to get to the industry people. The road rally just doesn't feel like that. It feels super supportive. Like we're all in this together and rising water floats all boats. So let's help each other. It's amazing. You'll see people who are six figure income earners helping people that are absolute newbies. They don't have to. You'd think they would just be trying to make another hundred grand a year, but they actually help people who are just getting started. And then those people a couple of years later helping people that are just getting started. So it's pretty cool. Um, we're all in the same boat. We are. Yep. Robbie Hancock says, yep, it's like a family, really. It really is. It's amazing. I mean, people literally get bummed out when they leave the road rally. They go home jazzed, but bummed out that it's over. Um, we love the road rally. Serious networking. I've learned so much and always leave inspired. Anthony says, Michael, thanks for everything, Taxi. I love the challenges, successes, and how much I've learned in such a short time. Already planning a trip to the Red Rally this year. Looking forward to it. Well, great. I look forward to seeing you there, Anthony. Marion Laird says, I love my taxi family. Um, Ann House says, the Road Rally was so chilled out, supportive, and informative last year. I got to say, every year it just keeps getting better. Um, 
Stephen Spinner says, I noticed your generous spirit, Robbie, on the chat, meaning uh, Robbie Hancock. Robbie's awesome. Um, the plane ride, Mark Emily says, the plane ride home sucks so badly. Ha ha. Uh, sitting in LAX on the way home. Um, anyway, so that's it. If nobody else has any questions, I'm going to finish 15 minutes early today. That means I get to eat dinner 15 minutes sooner. And I want to thank all of you for, uh, especially those of you who are like midnight, 1 a.m. Um, watching the show. I really appreciate it. And want to mention that next week I will be joined by Mr. Bobby Osinski, who is an engineer, a producer, and a social media expert. I don't know the topic yet, but he is locked in for next week, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and with that, I bid all of you adieu. Thank you for paying attention. We will see you next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye, ladies and gents. See you next week.